Welcome to the Hold the Line podcast, and what an incredible day. I get to be here with such a legend in Congress, uh, Kevin Hearn, who represents Oklahoma's first district, and uh, we are in a really prestigious room right now. Where are we at? This is the Sam Johnson Room, uh, Rayburn <coughs> Office Building uh, 2020, and I've spent the last two years here, lunch every Wednesday on Ways and Means. Uh, we have our a Republican-only luncheons in here. We did it in, in the minority, and really a uh, historic room in the sense that Sam Johnson, great war hero uh, from Texas, yeah. but uh, Ways and Means, the only committee that's mentioned in the United States Constitution, so it has been around since the founding of this country, and wow. uh, very honored to serve on there, uh, now starting my second term. Wow, uh, that's first, amazing. First Republican in over 20 years to serve on Ways and Means. Wow. So, all tax writing, all health care, all trade, all Social wow. Security. So it's the important stuff. It touches every American many yeah. times over, from cradle to grave. Wow, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. So we're we're here in this in this building here on Capitol Hill, and starting with the fact of the room that we're in, I'd love for you to just share a little bit of how did you get here. And well, how long is the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, I never had any aspirations. I, I grew up extraordinarily poor over yeah. in the Ozark Mountains. I guess prior to that, my uh, my dad served in the military, mm -hmm. and my mother had a child when she was very young with my dad, and she was 16, and I, she passed away a little after birth, and my mother had me and then had my brother, and my dad went to Vietnam many times over, and as a young mom with two children and had lost a baby, uh, lived in Air Force bases and decided that she could not endure this anymore, being a single mom, basically uh, married, but with a military uh, yeah. man across uh, in Vietnam. And they got a divorce and moved us to Arkansas, where they were both from, and uh, made some bad choices. Uh, married yeah. a guy who liked welfare and proceeded to have three more children. And, and so, um, wow. as a young age, until I was in eighth grade, had no running water, no indoor plumbing in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas, and lived on till eighth stand. grade. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any running water. No, Li lived uh, no indoor plumbing. Um, what? And. Uh, we lived on food stamps, and I, I made a conscious decision that I was not going to live like that, uh, being the oldest of five children, and uh, proceeded to start working. I would yeah. uh, skip school one day a week, many times over, to work at a sawmill, make $14 so I could have money for my gas in my car, because obviously you can't buy gas with food stamps. We had wow. no cash. And when I was in ninth grade, I started paying rent to stay home, and because he didn't want to work, my stepdad, and uh, when they had the truck repossessed, I convinced the bank when I was in 10th grade to let me make the payments. So I worked after school and no on way. the weekends. Yeah, so and through the summer. So, you know, it was really about taking a different direction. Yeah. And now I serve on the very committee in Congress that, that authorizes all of those, those bills and those um, pieces of legislation. But fast forward, uh, you know, through, through college, uh, paid for my engineering degree, went to a career tech in high school, college, engineering degree. Uh, as an aerospace engineer, space shuttle uh, shell Challenger blows up, change direction again, uh, get involved in McDonald's franchising program, spent 35 years uh, in McDonald's franchisee, sold our last five uh, about 18 months ago, my wife and I. And where, uh, were the, where did you own those? Uh, first one was in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. And then we sold, that was in January. So I got into the program in January of 87 took me 10 years to save $100,000. Uh, did real estate, no money down real estate. So I wrote software, had a hog farm, had rental property, and then all this. Hustler. Plus, plus worked 60 <laughs> to 80 hours a week in the franchising program. Wow. And, uh, and then moved, uh, uh, during that time, uh, I was married, uh, went through a divorce. Um, not, not good, but I was gone all the time, working all the time on this mission to, uh, you know, just to keep plowing ahead. And, and my wife at the time, who was my high school, uh, she was a year younger than my high school, and uh, she didn't want that program. Actually, her dad the one who introduced me to the McDonald's franchisees. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I'd kind of reset about five years into that process and uh, ended up with no place to live. Um, wow. Lived in a buddy of mine's house while he was moving. Uh, he he'd sold some McDonald's and moved to Florida, so I lived in that house. I had a blue recliner and a skillet. That's what I got out of the divorce. And so I had to start over in the middle of that. And I married a wonderful lady that's been my wife now for almost 30 years and a strong Christian who 
set me on the straight and narrow, which, uh, so I became a Christian when I was 31 years old. Wow. Yeah, and so uh, you know, we, we sold the one, and after 10 years, got our first restaurant in January of 97, and we sold it two years later, moved to Oklahoma, and went from two to 24 over the next, whatever that number is, 20 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. How did that, how did that hard work in, in the early years of you growing up translate to McDonald's? Well, a restaurant business is very difficult. Uh, I don't wish it on anyone. Uh, it's very, I, don't, I don't care if it's uh, a single steakhouse or if you're in the franchising business, which some would argue that you're serving a lot of masters because you have to serve the brand also, right. the franchisor. Right. But um, uh, as my staff knows today, uh, one, one of the things I was blessed with as a very young child was, you know, I say blessed with because it really matters a lot in the restaurant business and in yeah. Congress, my parents probably didn't think it was such a blessing because yeah. I could get up at five o'clock every single day and stay up till midnight every single day. So I'm not a person that requires a whole lot of sleep, and that's one of these traits that I've st stuck with me all of my life. And so I that's get a lot. That's probably helpful this week in Congress. Well, right? it, it's it's helpful <laughs> up here. Uh, I get a lot of things done when nobody's calling me on the phone uh, because everybody's sleeping. So every once in a while, my staff will tell you, I can feel them laughing over here because they know this to be true. I'll drop them a text, you know, 4.30 in the morning not expecting them to answer, but just to let them know that I'm up, you know. <laughs> um, and look at what you're missing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it is helpful up here. You get a lot wow. done. Um, the nice thing about the House of Representatives is being in Congress, where it's different than the Senate, the other end of the Capitol, is that working hard, uh, you can actually do something other than being in this seniority uh, track that you have to be in the Senate. So. I've been in Congress now four years, uh, sit on House Ways and Means, which is a very important committee. I would argue the most important committee. I'm a chairman of the Republican Study Committee, which is the largest caucus in all of Congress, either right. end of the Capitol. It's about 170 members. It's, statistically, it's about 80% of the Republican conference, so it's, yeah. it's, it's basically uh, pretty much the entire conference of the Republican Party. And so you have the ability to influence a lot of things and work on policy. It's not that political. We get some really cool uh, people to come in and talk. I had uh, CBO director two weeks ago. I had Ennis Cantor Freedom, who has been fighting yeah. back in the NBA. Yeah. Yep. And had him uh, two weeks ago uh, come in actually last week and talk about uh, his issue with Turkey putting out a $500,000 right. bounty on his head, <clears throat> an American citizen's head. Right. And then not having the administration back him up. Back him up. Yeah. I mean, he's an American citizen. Right. Uh, the American citizenry should have the the support right. of Americans having bound out. And right. yet we're still talking about an administration of sending them F-16s to appease them, uh, try to, to let right. Poland, or excuse right. me, let Finland and Sweden into the NATO. And so when you look at all these things, it's really uh, helpful. Uh, today we had Boris Johnson. Uh, From the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had breakfast with him this morning talking about what's going on in Ukraine. It's amazing. And then about a month ago, I had Liz Truss in her short tenure as you know, British Prime Minister. Right. But really a, a Reaganite, a, a, a you know, protege, if you will, right. of Reagan, and just didn't have the support. One of the things that's been very interesting to see Great Britain, obviously a place that we fought for independence from, you know, some yeah. 247 years ago now is to see where Great Britain is with runaway spending today, with overreach of their, their, their government into the daily lives yeah. of the Brits, and to see what's happened with their mighty empire that they had right. yeah. you know, for so long and how it can shrink. And it's a great lesson for us. It's a yeah. great lesson for us to know that no matter how big we get, all great empires fall if you don't control right. the way you spend your money and the way you treat your people. Wow. That's amazing. I, I actually, I, I love that you led into that. Um, I was, you know, today we were, well, first of all, the first time that we met, I think was 2019. Mm -hmm. I was running, it was the fall of 2019. I was running in District 3 in California for Congress. And you, I remember you looked at me in the coffee shop in Tulsa and you were like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> Why do you want to do this? Yeah, I'd only been in about a you year. Only I didn't even been in a year yet. You hadn't even been in a year, and you just came in, and, you were like, and I was like, you actually gave me second thoughts. I was like, maybe he's right. Like, um, But anyway, I, I I just, today we were walking around the Capitol, and we actually went, uh, I got to do some worship in the rotunda floor. There was no one there. It was really cool. Totally different vibe, by the way, in this regime change. Mm-hmm. 
uh, which is amazing. I want to get into that in a minute. And, but we were walking through um, up to the top of the, the, the very, very top of the Capitol and went outside, which oh, I've wow. never been up there. Wow. And I'm just always struck by the history of these hardworking, persevering, God-fearing leaders throughout American history that have created this nation to be what it is today. And then I think about people like you and your story and how you grew up and the hard work and the determination. What is your, how do you feel like that connection is so needed right now in America where there's so much entitlement and there's so much, you know, especially in the political world, you know? I mean, how does that, how did what you experienced and what you grew up in, how does that translate? Yeah, you know, to keep America on track. Yeah, so I ran for office. I think I'd share with you this this message when I ran back in 2019 was not for another career or for a paycheck. Uh, right. We were in a great spot in life and could be traveling around the world at this point in time in my, my life. But it was really about protecting the opportunity uh, for all Americans long after I'm gone. Right. And I think you know, the names are nameless over the decades and right. the hundreds of years that have done just that for all of us. You, you go put your marker down at a point in time, and if you do this for the right reason, not for yourself, but for the betterment of this country and the people in it, then you leave it a better place than right. where you found it. Um, there, there was a gentleman, Senator Tom Coburn, Congressman Tom Coburn, uh, was from where we built or got our first McDonald's in Oklahoma and got me involved in politics. I really didn't care anything about politics. I was 37 years old and, and he was coming out of Congress and he was a very um, principled statesman. Yeah. He had never ran for office, was a doctor, had been in business, and he ran into the notion of the same thing. I'm going here for a period of time. He self-imposed term limit back in the 94 when it came 40 years out of wandering in the darkness with the Democrat leadership in the House. and put down a set of markers that we want this to be a better place. He left in 2000, he ran in 2004. I'm a pilot, I flew him all over the state, learned a lot from him about being a principled legislator. Yeah. Again, that was 2004, I didn't start running for office until 2017. But that's always stuck with me. If you stay true to what you campaign on, if right. you run for the right reasons, this right. place is really an easy place to operate in. It's frustrating because you wonder why others can't see that as well. Right. But what's really frustrating, and you, you actually alluded to it, this country was founded on godly principles. Yeah. We know what Benjamin Franklin right. said when he, right. was, you know, he walked out, you know, we're giving you a republic if you can keep it. Right. Uh, we, I mean, the predictions of a default, every democracy has fallen. Only representative republics have the ability to withstand the test of time. Right. If you look at the great history of the great empires, the Romans, the Byzantines, the, you know, the Turkish, you know, the whole conversation around Great Britain, right. these have all been founded on, you know, sort of a democracy where a lot of people have a lot of voices. Right. It never works because pretty soon the, the, the louder voices, which are the, really the majority of all the voices, overwhelm the ones that need the most, the right. ones that are downtrodden. Where in a representative republic like we have here, it's my job to listen to 800,000 voices right. and, and come cast a vote. Right. Based, first of all, I have to run right. for this position. Right. And uh -huh. people know they vet you through the, the process. Then they send you up here to represent that Democrat right. Republic. Uh -huh. yeah. And so when you go through that process, you come up here with the idea that you know, this is what we have to do to go forward. And then you have this thing called a voting process yeah. that can get rid of you if you start drifting off from what you promised. Right. But one of the things that really motivated me to run was when Senator Coburn, after he had retired from the Senate, we're having breakfast one morning, and he knew my story very well, and this was in 2016, and he said, I'm not sure that a person today that comes from a background that you came from could ever achieve what you've achieved. That really broke my heart, to be honest with you. And I told my wife, and actually my wife said to me, said, you know, this is something you need to do. President Trump was running. She was a big supporter of President Trump. She said he's going to need help when he wins. She was a believer early on, uh, just like yeah. faith-based, prayed yeah. about it. This guy's going to win. He's going to need people like you. First time she'd ever talked about politics. That's crazy. And, you know, here we are. Wow. So do you feel like this, this grind that you grew up in, this hustle, this hard work, you know, I mean, I'm talking about this as, 
you know, we have four kids, me and my wife, and it's like we're trying to instill these principles. Do you see that, like, diminishing? I do. The next generation? Well, and I think one of the reasons, and I don't know that this <clears throat> has not always been the case, but just yesterday in the Ways and Means hearing, we, changed, we simply changed the name of the, of the subcommittee from Worker and Family Support, which handles all the social safety net programs except for food stamps. We changed it to Work and Welfare. Now, I would tell you that you would think that that would be pretty straightforward about what we do. We do child welfare programs in that subcommittee. Right. And, right. and it took us an hour and 20 minutes to debate the title of a committee because members of the Democrat Party <laughs> felt that, and, and there were actually silently some people on the Republican side that felt that welfare was a derogatory word. And I, I, they asked me to share my story, and I did. I had a lot of people, pe many people on the committee on the Democrat side know my story. But I shared it with them because I, I used the fact that there's nothing more dignifying than actually getting a job and working. Right, right. My mother passed away on January 2nd at 1220 in the morning, the first week of this year when we have all the debates. And, you know, people ask me about what you want you here. And I said, my mother always said, never stop working hard. The government will never make you rich. Having come from a person who had uh, lived her earlier life on food stamps and has seen the poverty that, you know, she could never get out of that um, because she had five kids and it was very difficult. She was, had a husband, my stepdad, who his hardest work was running to the mailbox to get a food stamp check. She saw what it did yeah. to the, uh, the dis disincentivation, if you will, uh, uh, to go to work, to right. get be tired yeah. every night. Right. And I, I when I was running, I, I kind of piggybacked off of Make America Great Again to say I want to make America tired again. And it would always get laughs everywhere because I said how I want people to come home at you know six o'clock, seven o'clock, yeah. be tired. Right. Spend some time with their wife and kids and go to bed. And get up the next day and do that time and time again. Yeah. And not be sitting on the couch, you know, playing video games at two in the morning. Oh man. So I, I think it's been, what, what I love about it, to be real honest with you, is it gives you a lot of credibility in what you're saying. Right. And there's so many people up here that talk about things they know nothing about. And uh, as an example yesterday, and we were talking about this committee, I said there were, there were 43 members on that committee, and I said I would argue that I'm the only one on this committee, this entire committee, the oldest committee in the United States of America, that actually lived on food stamps. It actually was <laughs> in poverty, yeah. and there wasn't anybody else saying, right. "Yeah, me too." Totally. So, yeah. you know, so I think that really does bring credibility. Oh, and, massive! Because I get criticized in the press for right. success, right? But nobody wants to talk about right. where you came totally. from. Totally. Yeah, and 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 your story is the great American story. Yeah. You know that is possible for everyone. I uh, speaking of working hard, um, Congress is finally working hard, mm -hmm. and in the last. I, you know, I have a lot of friends that have just been telling me it's been crazy around here. What are some things that we can expect, pray into? Obviously, you know, things have switched. McCarthy's a speaker. Um, how do, what should the posture of Americans be in our, setting our expectations for what can happen? Yeah, I, I tell you, I think the difference in the Democrat and Republican Party in my f sure, uh, four short years here is that Republicans believe in the individual liberties and freedoms of the American people, that you have the ability to succeed if we right. get the government out of the way. If we widen the curbs, you know, quit being so restrictive and saying right. the only way that you can right. succeed is right. if government gives you a check. Right. We know that doesn't work. Right. Uh, I saw it in my own personal life, early yeah. on in life, and, and human behavior is the same today as it was 20, 30, right. 100 years ago. If you make something easy, that's the path of least resistance, and that's the way that people go. Right. If you show people the way, you know, then you know. I always use the you know, give them a fish, feed them for a day, right, teach them right. a fish, feed them for a lifetime. Right. Yeah. And that's I think that's the difference, honestly. If you want to put a, uh, you know, if you want to put a narrative together, is to. Uh, by the way, most a lot of people think that's in the Bible. It's really not. It's a Chinese proverb. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the reality is, it it really is analogous to what we have here. Well, but you also have a lot of the parable of the talents. You have, yep, I mean, you, you have do. a lot of amazing, you, do. you, do. you know, economic principles found in Scripture taught by Jesus himself. Yeah, so, I mean, even if you look at that, I mean, it's like we don't, you know, what we've seen the last four years is uh, the Speaker of the House, Speaker Pelosi from your state. Um, Come on. 
Well, now we have a new speaker from your state. Look at that. <laughs> That's true. You know, look at Sammy. It's California. It's true. That's true. That is true. So, so uh, you know, we see what happened then. It was right. really a, a top down. Right. Don't engage your people. Right. All the bills came out of her office. Right. It was really an autocratic, you know, totally. authoritarian totally. rule. Yes. And now what we're seeing is, you know, it's we the people. People it's, are working together. Exactly. You're yeah, across you're, the board. You're listening. You're fighting. I even love that. Yeah. I'm like, I love that. They're fighting. They're arguing. They're they're discussing. Yeah. Like, let's go. Well, it's really, I mean, it takes a lot to unwind. You know, yeah. historically what's happened since the early 1900s is the progressive movement takes a lot of personal freedoms away. Right. And then hangs on to them in this institution because right. pe po people in power love power, right? Right. And so they get them, and they, yeah. you know, even Republicans are not good at unwinding that power. Right. Because totally. you have an institution. Right. So over the decades, the power, you know, you ramp up, and then it plateaus. you got Republicans right. there because we don't do power grabs right. on power from American people. Right. We want to do tax relief. We want to give the money right. back. We want to deregulate. And then, but we never undo any of the things the Democrats did. Yeah. And then the Democrats come back in charge, and then they ramp it back up again. And everything, we look over the period of time, you come from this level of regulations and taxation and the burdens of government on the people and to up here yeah, totally. over 100 years. Totally. And we can never get back to that. Totally. Well, I, you know, to talk about California and then to Oklahoma, you know, one of the biggest shockers to, to, to people across America, it wasn't a shock to me because I've lived there for, you know, six years now, was the performance of California and New York in the election mm -hmm. and how that really turned the tide, in my opinion. Majority you know, makers. Yeah, ma mm -hmm. majority makers and all of the districts that were flipped. I mean, there are districts in California that flipped red that haven't been since the 70s, you right. know. Um, there is a movement happening in places like that where people are like, enough's enough. Mm -hmm. You know, COVID was a huge, like, red pill, you know, for, for, for the world, but also for people within the state. What do you feel like the role is, and I used to live in Oklahoma for years, went to college there, mm -hmm. lived there when I got married, love Oklahoma, love Tulsa. What is the role right now politically for the quote unquote flyover? I mean, you know, whatever states, mm -hmm. the red states. What is the role? What do you feel like is the, the, the role moving forward into this new season? Yeah, I think, you know, as we go into it, we're in the majority. I think, you know, what we saw during the, the last four years was a resilience, was a right. pushing back. You know, obviously during COVID, right. the states that were open were the North Dakotas, South Dakotas, you know, the Kansas, the right. Oklahomas, right. the Texas, right. the, mid, the heartland Florida. of America, yeah. Florida. Uh, you saw the heartland of America pushing back. Right. Um, and we have to, now we're seeing this, the benefit of that. We're seeing yeah. the the testing of children, you know, there's no telling how far back some of the children in California, New York were set back. Um, and, and so I think those constitutional principles, I think our faith in God right. was, is really the core of where we're at. Yeah, come on. When you look at our churches that were closed down across right. America, right. I think it was an attempt by the Democrat Party uh, and certainly people who want to control this, this in our environment socially have tried to go out and shut down our, our churches across right. America. Yeah. And I go to church at uh, Battle Creek Church in Oklahoma and Tulsa there, and we've got like seven locations. And uh, Dr. Hermia, who is a great Christian, a uh, great leader, and we have three locations in the Middle East, right. um, half Egyptian, half Cajun, so that's an interesting pastor. <laughs> but, you know, he and I talked often about, you know, how the world crept into the church. Right. And, you know, yeah. we're still seeing this with a lot of conversations around right. LGBTQ. Right. Uh, we saw the Democrat Party and totally. the progressives trying to, you know, be punitive yeah. toward churches that wouldn't adopt right. that. We saw splitting of the Methodist Church. Right. We've seen what's happened in, the, you know, in a lot of the, uh, you know, Episcopalian churches. Right. We've seen a lot of, we, our largest United Methodist Church probably one of the largest in the country, Asbury there in Tulsa, huge campus, uh, and um, they've split. That's crazy. They've split. And so over us, whole social engineering right, thing right, done. Right, Well, we uh, we kicked, of course, you know, in, in, in some of our history, I mean, we've, in our church services and in worship, I mean, especially in COVID, we were attacked by Antifa, attacked by, uh, obviously, the liberal media, uh, blood poured on us by Satanists. We've been, but I thought a lot of that stuff would chill, and, uh, and it kind of has. And then New Year's Eve in San Diego, we held a big New Year's Eve worship gathering. We do it every year. Last year, we were in Miami and DeSantis came. This year, we're in San Diego. The night before that, that event, Antifa totally attacked this church in San Diego. I, like, n not a, 
a place known for their activity. And I knew, I was, I was like, okay, going into 2023, this is going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and you see that. You see 300, 300 or 350 attacks on pro-life churches in the last year. Let me ask you this. What do you, and maybe we can end with this, but what, what would you say that Congress is doing or can do in this season, even just on that, protecting religious liberty, protecting the churches that are, I mean, this church that got attacked is my, my buddy's church. Mm -hmm. um, mayor didn't say anything. Of course, governor didn't say anything. We didn't expect that. Um, barely got traction on the local news media. I mean, of course, it went viral because I took images of it. I mean, it, they spray painted the craziest, gnarliest stuff, broke windows. This is America. This is a church. Mm -hmm. So there were, just to show you sort of the split and the divide in the thinking, uh, I believe it was two weeks ago, maybe last week, we had some, one of our members put a bill on the floor, and I won't have all the verbiage right, but basically it created a federal offense for the defamation of a pro-life uh, facility or right. a church facility right. uh, for the purposes of Antifa or BLM right. or things like that. And every single Democrat voted against it. And so, you know, if you think about that, uh, trying to stop these, some of these movements and the Democrats in the House, every single one voted against it, is very problematic. Um, when, yeah. You know, so it tells you kind of where the ideology and the thinking is, is that, you know, you mentioned kind of the change. When I first got here, Chris Smith from New Jersey, he's been around here, he's the second oldest serving member of the House of Representatives, came in 1983 and uh, second in seniority. He has a pro-life caucus. And I asked him how many people are in the pro-life caucus do I want to join? And he said, now or when I started? I said, well, both. He said, when I started that there were 90, 90 Democrats in it. Today, there at that time, were three. That was four years ago. Today, there's one. And that's Henry Cuellar from South Texas. He's the only person that voted to protect life. That's insane. Two weeks ago, when we put the bill that's forward. That's insane. And so that's the change that you're seeing, yeah. uh, the Born Alive bill that right. passed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people are appalled. They cannot believe yeah. that children are being 100%. left unattended yes. if they were meant to be aborted and it yeah. failed yeah. and they're born. Gay. Before this, doctors could walk away and not violate their Hippocratic right. oath. Right. And so you know, all these things are really, really, um, really important. Yeah, and, it, and, and just to be really honest with you, it, it makes it very difficult to have any sort of uh, 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 of mix, you know, to have any sort of, you know, let's not be apolitical. Like, how can, I mean, this is like a life issue. This is, yes. a, this is a Genesis 1 issue. This is a Romans 1 issue. Yes. And there are no blue dog Democrats. There are no pro-life Democrats. I mean, it is the polarization is so insane right now. What would you, you, you've been one of the most, and this will be my last question, but you've been one of the most conservative members of Congress since you got here. I looked up your record. Good job on that, by the way, good job. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love the way that you vote. I love what you stand for. I'm, I'm, I'm all about it. What would be your encouragement, though, to Christians, believers across America that, um, are trying to navigate these divisive political polarizing times. What would be your encouragement and maybe a little bit of hope for what you see coming with this new Congress? Yeah, uh, the power of prayer first. I mean, we can do a lot, yeah. but there's nothing more powerful than prayer. Come on. Um, and I don't care what your denomination is. God right. answers all of those. Yeah. Um, I think also to know that uh, the Republican Party yeah. um, certainly believes God had his hand in founding this great nation. Right. Um, we'll never waver from that. Uh, we'll always push back on those who think otherwise. Uh, we'll always respect the individual uh, liberties and personal freedoms of every American, regardless whether they're Democrat or Republican, or don't right. give two hoots about politics. It doesn't matter of your skin color. Uh, contrary to many of the, the Democrats' rhetoric, because it is rhetoric, uh, Republicans aren't racist. Um, these policies have it's no... It's like the most diverse class Right. These, these policies have no color to right. them. Yeah. Uh, they are very successful people in America. We promote the rule of law, yeah. uh, unlike what we saw in all the cities, you know, the big cities across the nation right. from 2019 through 2021 into 22. 
um, we promote the rule of law. Yes. And, and so I mean, we want to make sure that the things that we do honor God in everything that we do. Uh, we had, you know, we have people here today from Israel. I had a prayer breakfast this morning over at the Museum of the Bible. And, you know, you had the Speaker of the House, yes. the majority leader there doing prayer with a lot of uh, individual rabbis and pastors from around the country at this morning. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Kevin McCarthy from California, Majority Leader Steve Scalise from Louisiana, they're praying with these individual pastors. Can you even envision that with Speaker Pelosi oh. and, and Steny Hoyer doing that? Yeah. I, I don't know their faith. Yeah. I know that they're both Catholic, but why you wouldn't examine your own yeah. and, and think about the power of what yeah. you are as an individual yeah. for portraying that. Yeah. And if you think about the President of the United States, why he says he is personally against abortion, he wants everybody to figure out on their own. He doesn't, he has separated himself from being an example for the rest of the country as a leader to being able to say that American can do what they want. And, and so we're, we're about promoting principles, yeah. uh, being honest with Americans, again, of all races, skin colors, nationalities, and making sure that people here are being protected, both here and abroad. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, we'll be praying. Um, we're going to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we started off the morning praying in the rotunda. Never mm -hmm. done that before, worshiping the rotunda. I mean, it feels like an open, there feels an openness and open heaven that I haven't experienced here, and we'll continue to lift you up in prayer. Thank you for sharing your story. It's great to be with this you. This is amazing. We love Oklahoma. <laughs> we love you guys. And, uh, hey, stay tuned. We're coming to Oklahoma City on the Kingdom of the Capital Tour. If you go to kingdomtothecapital.com, you can find out the date. We got our permits lined up. We're coming to Oklahoma City, I think in April. So we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Great, thank you.